Okay, so I'm I'm going to present the the last talk before our discussion portion of this of this symposium, and this is an output from a group called the International Partners for the Digital Extended Specimen. Um, there's a lot of us, as you can see. There's quite small writing for all of the authors there, um, but although we're grandly named the International Partners, and I will say, at the start, I was scratching my head and thinking, "Am I an international partner? Am I?" Am I that kind of that kind of level of authority? Um, it's a very open group, and if if you wish to join and get your name on that slide, then then contact us and 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 help us out. Can I change this? Yep. yep. Okay, so my my um, interaction with this group stemmed from a consultation exercise that the Biodiversity Alliance ran in 2021. And this was about uh, converging two ideas of um, what we might do after we've digitized specimens. So we've made over the past huge investment in digitization of, of specimens, making them digitally mobile aggregating them into, into data networks like GBIF. But then we wanted to think about what next. And I've shown up here uh, a quote that they had when, when this consultation exercise was kicked off. And I think it's really a nice one. So they said that um, a Brazilian plant specimen that has been collected and held in a European herbarium could be enhanced by contributions of Australi Australian taxonomists, Chinese biogeographers, and Kenyan geneticists. So we're building a, a network of data which truly is global and the applications of that data and the, the things that are done to that data and might go back to the source are, are global activities too. So the convergence of these two, two approaches, which in, uh, in Europe were in the lead up to DISCO called the Open Digital Specimen. And in America, the effort was called the ended specimen with the with the work of the international partners group were were kind of converged and published in this paper by hardesty in 2022 and they they draw out this diagram which which shows the kind of explosion of data as you as you get as you mobilize so at the, at the bottom of this inverted pyramid we have specimens which exist in the physical world as we move up into the central layer, then we we uh, we see an explosion of data as we as we digitise those data records because each one can be represented multiple times, and these are things which might exist in the collections management system. And the next layer up is digital extended specimens, so those records transcending the institutional collections management system, but sitting on the on the internet as fair digital objects. And the very top layer is where people are are doing new research with that data so they're integrating it with data products um, data sets from outside of our domain that may be climatic for example and publishing that data online so the the subject of, the, of this um, symposium obviously is making sure that we have backlinks through through all this all these all these different layers too one of the works one of the activities that we did through the International Partners Group is we meet every month or so. And um, one of the things we found that we were talking about the problem at very, very different scales. So we had the, this design template and we'd each tried to write out in a page what we what we thought we were trying to do. And personally, I found this really useful because the, the first thing that this, this template asks you to write down what the problem is. And uh, as you may have seen in some of the talks in this session today, the, the problem exists on, on many different layers and scales. So some people in this problem um, problem area wrote, uh, it's difficult for me as a collections management system because I'm not getting the identifications back when, when my records are, are uh, used by someone in, a, in another institution. And some people in the problem box wrote, there's a biodiversity crisis globally. So it was quite good for us to know like <laughs> the two different, well, many, many different levels of, of problem that we're trying to address. And also like, at what level should we pitch when we're talking about talking about these these problems? Um, yeah, I find I found that really useful. That um, one of the things we did this summer at Digital Data, which is the conference which is organised by IDIG Bio, 
is we had this really practical session. So we had 140 people, both online and in the room. And we had uh, presentations from a lot of the people who were, who were in the group. So um, from from GBIF, from iDigBio, from Disco, from the Symbiota Network. And one of the things that we did there was had the, had these talks and had a bit of a bit of introductory discussion about what we were trying to do. And then we had split up into groups and did this practical exercise where the the, the real real use of, of the workshop came out for, for me at least. So we sat down and we thought, well, if you're trying to build an extended specimen, like how would you actually do it? And we gave people a range of different specimen records that we know exist in, in data aggregators around the world. And we said, off you go with your, with your phones and your internet connection and, and find what data could be linked to it. And we drew them out on these big sheets of paper. So here's one. Um, this is a mouse specimen, so a bit out of my comfort zone, given um, I'm, I'm from a botanical institution. But we went around and we, we found different pieces of data that we could link and extend that specimen to. And we tried to classify how accessible those extra pieces of extended data would be. So is it a connection that exists already? So, so some, some data is, is linked up already, like, for example, a lot of data is georeferenced that we, that we publish out. Some were things that we thought could easily be made and some, the other thing on the other end that we wanted to extend to, we weren't even sure if that was digitized yet. So we, we identified those in a different way. I'd be really interested in running this, this kind of uh, event again. I, I think that, that really did uh, solidify a lot, a, lot of, um, a lot of questions for people. And we came out with some discussion points at the end of that workshop. Um, again, quite high level ones. So really, um, fundamentally, and I think James uh, alluded to this in his introduction to the session and his first talk is, what are we proposing that we should build? Is it a massive central repository of data or is it a repository of links between those data? Um, what, what kind of actions do we trigger? If we have a digitally extended specimen, what do we expect to be reintegrated back to the content management system when when a, when a annotation is is made on a piece of data when it exists in a in a separate digital system and i think that links to the to the question that, that henry posed earlier and who really is responsible for this because this sounds like a massive and big undertaking for who can create and maintain persistent identifiers i know james valiantly tried to to keep the pid conversation out of this symposium but i think it's it's probably unavoidable um, but yeah who creates and maintains this um, because obviously all this this thing obviously only only really is going to work if we can persistently identify the data as it flows into different networks. This is a obligatory slide of logos of people who are involved in in this uh, in this group. Um, it's not complete. Um, it indicates that a lot of us are our roles are multifaceted. So, for example, I come from Kew Gardens in London. My my institutional slide is not there, but um, I'm participant in the GBIF network and in in Disco UK. So we all have different roles that we play in in our own institutions, and um, we play different roles in in discussing this too. Uh, I'll end with a couple of partner activities that we've done through the past year. Um, the work that GBIF are doing on developing a new data model obviously is, is, uh, is contributory to this effort. And they're working on that by documenting use cases. They acknowledge that these are at different levels of maturity, but you can see them if you follow that link to the, to the new data model work. And they're now working on data publishing models and, and updating the IPT. Um, Disco is doing a whole load of work on identifier assignment and the annotation scheme. And yesterday, if, if you saw Vauter's talk, he, he did, a, did a whole session on that. So I'm not going to try and replicate that here. Um, but Vauter is here in the room. So please go talk to him or, or have a look at the talk recording and, and find out about that there. And uh, our colleagues in the Atlas of Living Australia uh, identified some of the problems that are that they identify, which they call pinch points when they're when they're data sharing. And that was a that was a talk that was given at Spinach. And Ellie and Shelley both are here too, so you can follow that up with them. Um, 
I did bio uh, organized the event where we did the the extended um, extended specimen kind of paper exercise, and they're also working with the U.S. collections community on this idea that they will build a biological collections action center. And Pam is here from my my dig bio, so she's someone that you can follow up that with. So we know that, <coughs> excuse me, linking biodiversity data is going to be a community process. Um, this QR code here will take you to a, a Google Doc with questions that we've accumulated as we presented this this idea around at different conferences. But the questions that, that the group posed really are high level ones. So. So where do we want to go and who is involved and how do we how do we actually make that happen? And <clears throat> we really want to recognize that although it's very much reliant on technology, uh, it's a really it's a person effort to, to get this to work. And it's probably going to be a change in the way that we we manage our data and the way that people manage our data. So everyone needs to have a voice here. And, and that's really what we want, what we want to, to make sure happens. Um, if you're interested in, in participating in the group, then yeah, come and talk to me or any other people with their names on this slide. Thanks for your attention. Is James still around? Okay. Do you want to handle the discussion session, James? Hey, Nikki, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, great. Um, I'm happy to uh, coordinate. Uh, Nikki, uh, we can do this together. You can see the hands and, and interact with people. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so it's uh, slightly awkward, but do our best. And I should say that I have David Shorthouse sitting beside me. And Falco, I believe, is also in line. Hi, it's Henry again. Um, so my question earlier was about um, with annotating specimens and is there a hierarchy in kind of who owns the original data? If that um, person at the top of that pyramid says, I disagree with the information, um, how, do, how does all this information get shared within the community so that there is some understanding as to what's happening or does multiple versions of the same thing exist out there because of the maybe the synchronicity pr uh, problem which much has also pointed out so um, this question was originally asked concerning symbiota and I could explain that part um, the uh, so within symbiota you might have a situation and this is real situation where maybe um, you have a specimen that's managed at Arizona State University that was originally collected in Gabon is digitized, a uh, snapshot of that record was pushed up the Gabon data portal. Someone from Gabon might see it and say, hey, that's not georeferenced. And I know that place rather well. And so they might go in there and add coordinates. And so, however, there's a number of different collisions that could happen at that point. Um, so that annotation was added to the snapshot record that's distributed in the other portal. Um, it might be set up where that data set's updated on a regular basis. It might even be nightly. So it, what might happen is that when that data is refreshed, that empty coordinates might copy over those existing coordinates. But within Symbi the way Symbiota handles that is anytime there's an uh, edit that's made to an occurrence record, um, it stores, it versions that information in versioning table. So it records who made the edit, when they made it, and the old value and the new value. So in that case, 
there's several fields that are changed, the digital latitude, digital longitude, ideally also other metadata. And so that's um, for each of those fields, you get a new record of um, um, recording that edit. So it's not lost. So, um, and uh, let's say that my managed record, let's say someone says, hey, that's not georeference and they georeference it there. You want that data to flow up. Well, fl data flowing up from a live record to a snapshot could be set where it automatically happens. So now you might have two coordinates up in that snapshot record. Now pulling that information back down, the collection manager actually has to approve that. So we need a system where they could look up and say, okay, there's these annotations on these records distributed in these areas, and then they can make decisions based on evaluating who made them, when they were made, so forth, and then bring them back in. So that's where some negotiations helped happen. And that's what we're working on now. Coming to you, Deb. I was wondering, is Vince in the room? No? Vince Smith is here, too. I was wondering what his take is on the development of Recode in terms of handling annotations. So in the scenario you just gave, Ed, would would someone online be able to see both of those things that you just mentioned? So accepting one back into your local space for you as the collection manager is different than if you have both, can you share them so that other people in the outside world can see? Things like differences in an annotation determination. I realize it's a little different than the example you gave. So if you had two annotations on the same record about like the determination, would you be able to see both? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So the determination histories are viewable to the public. Um, as far as these annotations to the records, right now within Symbiota, they're, um, they're only viewable by the collection managers with approved. So that's one thing we do have to work out is which annotations um, are publicly viewable, who decides that. And also we would, we want a situation where um, someone's doing some research and, and there's specimens there, can they make their annotations and have those annotations be included in their downloads? Overriding, let's say they see a bunch of specimens that are um, not georeferenced, can they go in there and georeference them? And if the collection manager hasn't approved that information to be pulled into their collection, can they still use it? So that's the type of function functionality that we want, where um, even though the annotations weren't approved in the live collection, at least the people doing the research and making the annotations, they still can make use of that data in their data set. Thanks, Ed. Um, there is a question from James online. He's asking, can we please have a show of hands? How many in the room are interested in participating in the annotation interest group um, with a new task group? If so, what would some like to do? So who's interested in um, potentially being in an annotation interest group? Okay, so we've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or eleven, or twelve, or thirteen, or so. Sorry, about thirteen or so. Okay, does that answer your question, James? I think you're not online anymore, except by the chat. I don't know. It's up to her. Yep, go for it. Thank you. Uh, I have some flashbacks to my first start week, which was 2012 in Beijing. I was in the bus with Anton Gunsch and everybody was counting annotations. It was a bit scary. Uh, and, uh, and what I actually want to ask is, um, would you share my view on this? Uh, the annotations are very popular in the collections community. People who work with other types of evidence when there is no static physical object behind, uh, somehow less excited about that. And, but the only, the only type of, of data manager who is really excited about annotations is actual data curator. And data producers, data holders, 
often, and I see it in GBF a lot, see data publishing as a publishing of static cold objects that nothing will happen to them after publication, which is wrong, of course. Uh, users also perceive data in, in, in the state they access it, it, they download, that's what you have. Very few people in the broader biodiversity community outside Tadwick see data as digitally cultivatable entity, open for feedback, open for annotations. So the, I think there is a huge perception, psychology, marketing problem. The session is about technical solutions, so maybe it's a bit off topic, but I would like to hear opinions about that. Is there, is there, is there a kind of marketing fix how to make annotations and feedback popular in general? I don't see that happening between Tadwick 2012 and Tadwick now. It's still where it was. Can you hear? It was clearly scoped as being about collections management systems. So I, I think the, the scope was very much about the uh, updates and annotations of round tripping between uh, the presentation of a collection record which relates to a physical specimen in the digital form when, it, when it's shared into aggregators. I, I understand the, the concerns about people who work on other kinds of data. Um, uh, I think we've got a big enough problem to fix with collections, to, to be honest, without uh, without looking for new audiences. Um, I have some ideas on that, but I'm respectful that other people have questions, but I would love to come back to that if there's time, Nikki yeah. and, and, and Shelley, if you... Somebody over there had their hand up earlier, so I don't, I don't know. Who had their hand up earlier? Yeah, somebody, somebody on that side had their hand up earlier. Uh, thanks. Yeah, my, my question would be to symbiota person. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering um, how, you know, you, you said that you have like a resolution center within symbiota where, you know, if there is any issues that could be fixed, uh, you know, annotations could be fixed. Let's say if there are some, you know, somebody sees some problems and want to edit those annotations, but how that this then speaks to other, you know, biodiversity resources. So because my understanding that some symbiota tool is simply a collaboration tool for, you know, different projects and maybe small collections, um, that not specifically, you know, communicating then with other portals. And if something has been, you know, identified as a problematic record of annotation that links to the like physical specimen, how they then translate further, you know, so is there any centralized body, you know, for this, for the culture management collection that was actually propagated, okay, you know, there was you identified over there and, you know, now that has been fixed and it's actually been propagated to all other resources so that people are aware of that, either like centralized resolution center, like, I don't know, I'm just curious. <laughs> Thanks. Coming. I'll get my steps into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, that's one reason that I would like to actually interact with the annotation working group and the aspect of, you know, we got this system where it's working out within Symbiota, but it's agreed on like um, communication going on between a very controlled system. Um, we, before I said that the annotations are just viewable by administrators, that's actually not totally true. The, through the API, we did expose the annotations through the API with the idea that snapshot collections that are managed with an external um, data management tools. We're hoping that people can do processing and editing of the records within Symbiota and that's exposable. So we did make that exposable, but these other institutions help to bring them in too. We do have um, through the API infrastructure, the first version, um, geolocate does um, we do have a tool where through API data travel a data set could be pushed of non-geo-referenced specimens could be pushed into geolocate and then it's um, edited and as soon as those coordinates are edited it, it triggers a write back to Symbiota and if that fields the geo-reference fields are still empty it's populated but it, it's also populated in the versioning tables to keep track of who did it. That's an external edit coming in. Um, but again, this is like controlled where I worked with um, Nelson Rios 
we worked together to make sure that we knew what the messages were going to be back and forth between our systems. But it would be far better to have it where it's based on a certain standard where, um, where it could work across other systems where they know exactly what to expect coming out of Symbiota based on a standard and they don't have to work specifically with our developers to get that communication going. So, so I mean, we've, we've shown that this could be done, but I mean, it's, it's by far not interoperability across all those systems. And so we would like to actually work towards improving that on our end. Great. Got a question down the back, then um, James has a question and then I'll come to you. Yeah. I have a question so like for the bicycles, name matching, because uh, you mentioned, I think I've seen your abstract mentioning, so like it's the wicked data, they don't actually have any binomial information, but they do, just like they actually have a single column, it's actually about like, binomials like data, so possibly be either the ID of the binomial and also the Oki ID, and simultaneously the binomial data, they the collector names, they do actually have like a column is actually for the wiki data as well. But the problem is the overlap percentage between them. I'm not sure for the whole natural history collector set, but for the botanist collector set, it's actually only 40%. And another problem with the ORCID ID that you mentioned that is actually not all of the binomial data collector they do actually have an uh, ORCID ID. And sometimes like the binomial data like, is actually for the name string matching, they are not actually English. So for this some sort of like problems, like uh, how your algorithms or your pipeline will actually think about to manage this sort of things. Uh, it's okay, thank you. Um... I'm not sure I understood your full question because, well, there was a lot of uh, background in it. Um, as far as I can see, well, could you repeat the specific question? Yeah, because I would try to simplify a bit. So first of all, as so you mentioned that you want to use the Wikipedia ID, the Wiki ID and the binomial ORCID ID, but the because uh, we did similar research before, but mm. just for the botanist collector and the overlap percentage in botanist collector between these two, like using these two features, are actually like below 40% of overlap. It. So, so it means like you probably have 60% of the data doesn't actually have any tr ground truth like for it. And another thing is actually the binomials, like uh, the structure about like lot register for the binomial is not significantly to be English. So it means like you probably will actually have different language within the binomial collector names. So for just two like quite critical issues, how do you actually manage within a pipeline? Well, so uh, currently at the moment, it still uses only the, uh, the English labels and the aliases from Wikidata, but that could be adjusted. That's just a feature currently there because, so one of the problems with aggregating data from Wikidata to do the matching at a local uh, server is that the queries tend to time out, especially when they get bigger and they do get bigger over time. There's some of them that keep timing out and then you have to redo them all the time. So our solution was to keep them as simple as possible. And that also means you don't extract all the labels. There is a workaround for this. Uh, short answer. Um, yeah, so, yeah, maybe that's better because I'm afraid I don't have a short answer uh, for this. <laughs> um, Yes, so well, maybe a short answer, we've made the workflow to be as modular as possible. So if there's different cases, different conditions popping up, we should be able to adjust it and implement it that way. So that's, I don't know, that's very generic and short, but yeah, we're running out of time apparently. James, are you still online? Yes, I'm trying to be. <laughs> Can you hear me? Would you like to unmute and finish? I did unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Is that a yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, I think all we have time to say is thank you very much for everyone, to the speakers and those attending. And you'll hear more about uh, the annotations interest group uh, and trying to reinvigorate that in the next month or so.